Welcome to Loop TV. I'm Gene along with Andrew. Our topic today is augmented reality, specifically wearables. And we are sitting right between Google's I.O. event and the upcoming WWDC from Apple and wanted to bring uh, Andrew and I together to just discuss what the trajectory of this uh, next gen interface is going to look like. And I'm going to just start with some definitions around augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality, and start in reverse order here. Virtual reality is an experience where you put uh, glasses on, goggles on, and you have no uh, access to the outside world. It's internally uh, projected. There's no outside cameras. Uh, that is step one. Obviously, that's been around for a long time. Step two is mixed reality, and that is also your eyes are not on the real world, but there are cameras on the outside of the device that bring the real world into the uh, experience and it is a step in between uh, augmented reality which is kind of the the nirvana here uh, augmented reality is your eyes are on the real world and virtual objects are being anchored into the uh, virtual objects are being anchored onto the real world and you see them through some form of a wearable uh, display and in a so that's the kind of the three definitional pieces about uh, the the topic around the next gen wearables and Andrew as uh, maybe as just a starting point when you think about AR and AR headsets um, maybe let's do both of those uh, start with AR are you a believer in AR well I would say that I'm a believer in quick access to bits of information right I think about how I use my watch for example and I can glance to see. Uh, that it's going to rain in a few minutes, right? And it's going to last for a half hour. So I probably shouldn't take the dog for a walk. Um, that is uh, valuable information delivered kind of in the moment of necessity. Uh, and I think that AR and, and glasses particularly um, offer that type of utility to a user. So is there um, a reason for these companies to be exploring augmented reality? Yes, I'm a believer in that. But there's more than just the usefulness, right? It's like, uh, not just what are those tent pole features, but how much do I benefit from them? And how much is that worth to me? And then can they deliver a product um, for that much that uh, for me to buy it for that much, right? That mm -hmm. those three vectors need to come together. And when we're thinking about products, it's not just about what's capable or new technology on the horizon, but really combining um, the customer need and the solution with what's possible at a certain cost. If you would think a few, let's say 10 years ago, pre-Apple Watch, uh, maybe 15 years ago, really pre-internet uh, 2.0, that idea of having minute-to-minute -minute, uh, weather to your wrist. If we we're going to have a conversation about, you know, what do you want from a consumer standpoint? Do you think you would have been able to have envisioned that as like a, a use case for Apple Watch, or is that well, an example where uh, technology has uh, gone before us and uh, come to us? and has created use cases that we feel we can't live without. Well, think about how television has evolved. If I try and go back 10, 15 years, um, I'm, I'm uh, without my watch, without my AirPods, I maybe have a cell phone, um, but I lot, watch a lot of TV. And TV evolved in a way that gave us more information uh, at the minute uh, as we watched. For example, the ticker at the bottom would show sports scores on ESPN or stock quotes on CNBC. Um, I remember my grandpa a long time ago saying how silly it was that the score of the football game was always in the upper left corner. And uh, I rely on that. Like he just knew what the score was because he was watching the game. That was his thought, right? Why do you need to remind me at all times what the score is? I'm watching the game. I know what the score is. But human nature is inclined towards that convenience and ease of information. So I think the trajectory in general is just more information for us to consume in more layers also, mm -hmm. right? 
that that score is hovering over the football game or the ticker at the bottom is an augmented layer to the broadcast. And so mm-hmm. even pre-phone, pre-watch, all of that, the general trajectory is clearly more information, even though sometimes it sounds um, like too much. I, I think, I think it Im- always sounds like too much. It's an important point relative to, I think, the – group that would say that AR, we don't want this kind of information flow is that it's hard to, and there's no use cases for AR, for example, is that it, it would have hard, it would have been hard in 1970 to have dreamed up the first, uh, first downline in, in football. You uh, love it, the it, first downline, by the way. <laughs> I do love it. Uh, makes my, my job a little bit easier. And I uh, go to your watch example and the weather. And I think that um, the 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 uh, logic that we can't quite really hammer out what the the true use case is. Google tried at I/O this week. They talked about this real time translation, which, by the way, is something that when we started Loop five years ago, we talked about as an example of an AR wearable. Is uh, you could go anywhere. Pretty small market for people that can uh, go and want to wear glasses and and have translations real time. I was surprised in- to hear you say that. Um, in the the note that you wrote and and here just now, explain to me why that wasn't very compelling to you. Well, it's a compelling use case, a high, but there's just most people speak one language. Even people who are in in Europe, who there are a lot of countries around them, uh, they still generally speak one language. And so I, I there's people who are uh, who move from one country to the other. People. And so I, I can see that being a, a high valuable, very valuable, but it's not, this is not a TikTok billion type of uh, a user yeah. uh, or, you know, a smartphone Fair. 4 billion type of user kind of a, an opportunity. My, my, where I was going was the, that's a use case uh, that makes sense and it's easy for us to frame in. And I, I asked whether you're a believer in AR and, and you said, yes, you're a believer in information coming to us more fat, more quickly. And that's going to be uh, AR's one mechanism to deliver that. And then I would agree with that. I like how you describe that. I uh, I question whether today I want information overlaid as I'm looking on the real world. I'm questioning that. But I also look at my own behavior. How many times I check my phone a day? I bet I check my phone, my phone 300 times a day. And I'm conscious of it. And... I don't want to check my phone 300 times a day. And I think that what that tells me is that even though that experience may seem gross of putting on glasses and having weather overlaid and people's names overlaid and real-time translations overlaid or, or working on a repairing a dishwasher and having some of the repair instructions overlaid, all that may seem just overwhelming. I think that the reality is we want more information quickly. That's a great way you described it. My guess is that sometimes you're checking your phone to see if you need to check it, right? You're right. checking your phone. That to is see, true. Do that I is have true. any? That's probably 50 that times a day. Right. And then the watch came along and removed some of that. I definitely check my my phone less because my watch buzzes if I really need to know something, right? Like someone's Mm -hmm. calling, I can glance to see who it is, or I got a text from a certain person. What if augmented reality was just bits of information at at an even higher threshold of sort of urgency and importance where only, you know, it wasn't information constantly in front of you in the world. In fact, it was rarely in front of you, but maybe for, you, you wear it for all day long, like I wear my glasses, and really only there's information coming in, um, like, like my watch, right, is maybe 20 times a day that it mm-hmm. takes one or two seconds or 10 times a day to notify you of something urgent and important. And then you don't have to check your watch and you don't have to check your phone. Does that- I, would, I would say that's aspirational and human nature is to what's it, the second law of thermodynamics is going to go from orderly to disorderly. I think human nature is going to end up where people are going to, people like you will have the, a lot of them, a really tailored experience. I think a lot of people will just say, 
give it to me give me it all just let's just go let's just go crazy and so would you I, say then that there is demand for that i think there is i think the the appetite for tech it's um Insatiable. go back to the printing press uh it's it's out there and uh, that is a, a well-traveled road. It's why we do what we do is because we have confidence that the world is going to evolve at a rapid pace and we can profit for our investors based on that. Uh, let's talk about timing of, of these devices. So I think we're probably on the same page that both Google, uh, Apple, and Facebook are getting there. One other just quick one, if you hadn't seen the note, is uh, one thing I uh, was – uh, angling towards is I think Facebook really isn't going to be a player in hardware. They're there with Quest today. They're doing a great job. They're investing a lot of money, $10 billion. $10 billion is a big number. If you look at Google, they'll spend about $35 billion in uh, total R&D this year. Apple's going to be right around $30 billion. So a $10 billion number just on their reality labs at Facebook. That's a, a very large investment. I don't think that they're going to get to where they need to uh, to get away from Apple when it comes to the hardware ecosystem. And so why I believe that is that I think that hardware just isn't core to Facebook as much as they want to invest in it. Uh, we are investors, by the way, in Facebook because we believe in the metaverse and believe in the power of their, their uh, stickiness of their platforms. And uh, so that was kind of one contour. Most people kind of think of the the three race between Apple, Facebook, and and Google around Another these. The thing I'd say on Facebook too is that the operating system, like Quest hardware is pretty good. It's not Apple level to your point, but the operating system is really hard for mm -hmm. new users, for even like um, familiar users. It's just not a great experience like the iPhone was on day one out of the box. That hardware software interaction is something Facebook struggles with. So I want to talk about the out of the box piece because what is rumored over what we think is probably sometime and I think is sometime in announced in 2023 at WWDC, which means a year from now, Apple debuts or at least shows its mixed reality headset. Again, mixed reality, so somewhere between virtual and augmented reality. It's got a big price tag. A lot of people have written about this. Mark Gurman's done a lot of reporting on it. Uh, the information has recently done a big piece on it. And um, one thing, Andrew, that you, your view is, it's an important view, which is just around the, the concept that uh, is, does it really fit? And you've challenged me on that. Does it really fit for Apple to have a $3,000 mixed reality headset? And uh, tell me more. Well, if the goal is Apple glasses, really a $400 consumer friendly. Agree, that's the goal. Whole, device. Yeah. The question is, will, would Apple do some sort of a stepping stone product like a mixed reality headset at a really high price point as has been reported? And it just strikes me as something that Apple hasn't traditionally done. Uh, they wait until a great product is ready and then ship it. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, goes back to what we were talking about earlier, like how does the, the those vectors of utility and price and value meet for the consumer? And is there room for a $3,000 mixed reality headset? And there's so many unanswered questions. And, and just strategically, we don't we haven't seen Apple do a ton of that. It doesn't, it doesn't jive for me as a way that they develop and, and ship and launch and get millions, hundreds of millions, a billion consumers excited about a new product. I understand that that uh, rationale. I'm in a slightly different place. I think that, uh, yes, that the biggest opportunity is AR glasses, but that doesn't mean that the uh, that the an MR headset is a worthwhile, is a measurable, has a place on their long-term product roadmap. And of course, the easy examples would be Mac and iPad. Each of them are about 10% of overall revenue. It's good that they do those products. They're a different experience. I don't know what comes back to this use case of kind of dreaming up how we use these different technologies. I don't know what the true experience difference is going to be between mixed reality and the augmented reality wearables. I suspect you're going to be able to do some things on one that you can't do on the other. And so I leave open the uh, an opportunity that this could be the, the Mac, for example, when it comes to augmented reality, the mixed reality headset. 
I, I, and as far as uh, price points, um, the Mac is a reminder, MacBook Air starts at $1,000. And so, and you can easily spend four or $5,000 on it. And so, um, at, uh, my guess is the average Mac price, the ASP is probably right around $1,600. So the 3000 is not going to fly. Agree with you there. But I think you could, as that drifts down to maybe $1,500, I think it could play a different place in the broader uh, roadmap to really what is the whole a new paradigm around an interface. Yeah, that that resonates. And, and they do like to start with one great more expensive SKU that kind of over time, they ride a cost curve down, they offer older models at cheaper prices. And so there is um, the the longer term potential for sure for them to um, take that same sort of uh, ex- product line expansion strategy, even if they started with the $3,000 machine. One other question that I wondered as I as I read reporting and, and think about it for our own work, is whether or not they need to do something like a mixed reality headset. And are we closer to the Google, or sorry, the Apple Glass augmented reality glasses uh, than we might think? And I think I love to look at the breadcrumbs that are available to us today. Mm -hmm. Two of them that I think are really important are AirPods and Apple Watch. AirPods in a very small space-constrained product, right, have... I got to be careful here. Hey, hey Siri, right? Which is always listening. And that's to, to power that and to offer that capability in a product that small that's in your ear for multiple hours a day is an incredible accomplishment. Then on your wrist, you've got the watch, which now has an always on display. I charge mm-hmm. it at night. Not even I, I sleep with the thing on. Now I charge it maybe an hour a day. And it lasts the rest of the day. 23 hours, this display is on, on my wrist. So are we closer to having projection capability or display capability and Siri listening capability than we might think? And if it's ultra simple and cheap, or not cheap, but lower, more affordable, Mm -hmm. could they get to something like that where it delivers real value at a $1,000 price point? Agree. Uh, right question. My sense is that it's still much further away. I think from a technology standpoint, With the to be able to take mix. yeah the projection. The technology issue is getting these digital assets to first to be we overuse the term anchor, but to anchor in the real world, and uh, so they're not like floating around and kind of yeah. bopping just, around. And the second, arrows for directions are clear and you can follow it. Right that's one issue. The and the yeah. second is just still the speeds. And uh, just think about how fast you're, the mind, that is that is another common thing that we come back to is just how incredible the human body is. But the ability to, as you move your head and be able to uh, track, bring in data at that speed, you get pretty dizzy if it was, uh, if this, if these images were coming up a split second later in a mixed reality environment, you can manage some yeah, of that latency. Latency, thank you. Um, so I think those would be examples of why I think we're still uh, three, four years yeah. away from. And here we land, kind of back again at <laughs> 2023 or beyond. Yep, that's a good takeaway from today. It's still some time. <laughs> Probably another takeaway is we're both on board with it, and we both want. Uh, the, the flag to read clearly that we're believers in this technology and that Apple's going to play a big role in it. It's not in our Apple model, safe to say there. It, I hope it will be. We've had lessons we've learned in the past on that. We're sitting tight before we find the addition button on that front. I uh, always like finding, uh, Andrew, the button to get you on Loop TV. I appreciate your insights. You've been uh, following Apple for a long time, 20 years. Uh, thanks for weighing in. On behalf of Andrew, Gene, and Loop TV, bye for now.